I'm uh, Dr. Santosh Gurung. I'm working with the EPI uh, program uh, with the technical team in the program strengthening in the EPI with the IVV immunization vaccine and biologics with the WHO headquarters team. Um, uh, I work with the measles team uh, more on the program implementation. Uh, but lately, I've also been uh, pulled into the COVAX work stream, and uh, that's also been my primary focus of work in the past year. You've spent most of your career working with immunizations. Can you tell us a little bit about how attitudes towards immunizations and vaccinations have changed? Uh, working with public health, it's all been with immunizations. So uh, I feel very fortunate to be a part of that uh, 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 that process. Uh, but, um, so. I think even uh, when I uh, when I transitioned from my clinical work into public health, uh, initially, 14 years back, I I really took up this uh, challenge of um, uh, taking up a job in a very like a low resource or a constrained settings in WHO in Nepal, and really I felt that 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 was very important step in my in the start of my career to really get into the grassroots and the, and the building blocks of how public health is all happening at the ground level. So I, I started my work as a um, surveillance medical officer, and then I gradually progressed um, um, yeah, uh, to uh, the national position and then moving into the regional office position in, in, in the Western Pacific. And now I'm currently working at the global level. So I think uh, I feel uh, very fortunate like you said, and also I feel very fortunate because EPI is a very mature and a very robust program. It's come over the years, right? So I, I feel I feel very uh, good to be a part of this uh, this uh, this uh, public health intervention. And in general, uh, your question about attitude, I think at every step of my experience, uh, different challenges have existed and um, have have come across my way. But I think there. Are, it's, it, it's, it's only leading to innovations and solutions. So I feel it's a good feeling. Uh, it leaves me optimistic. Uh, and just being, just I think, just to, to just to give you a concrete example, just I think working with the vaccinators and seeing them walk for days to conduct an outreach clinic or even a caregiver making it such an effort to kind of bring the children to the uh, international session site. I feel very optimistic about this. and. Um, and, uh, and now progressing to the global level, and I see this really collective effort uh, at the country level, at the regions, and then at the global level, all working very collectively to harmonize this effort. Um, so it all leaves you very, very optimistic. And I, I personally, I feel very humbled to be a part of this um, uh, program, uh, the EPI program, and uh, which is making an effort to ensure that um, all the children in the world are being benefited from this life-saving uh, vaccines. What would you say has been the biggest challenge that you faced in your career? In terms of challenges, I think um, at every step, it's been very different. Um, working in the field offices, like I said, when I started off my career, it's been a lot of physical challenges, right? I think in some of, uh, we had to really go out in some remote districts in, 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 in the countries where roads are inaccessible. So I remember walking for like four to five days to reach the headquarters in the district and then moving into the sub districts to kind of making sure that the implementation is all happening. So these, these I think it was a lot of, um, uh, it was a lot of challenges physically just uh, getting there and also living uh, uh, for a couple of months to kind of make sure that the program is running. So a lot of physical challenges, but in terms of programmatic challenges also, there's been a few. I think um, at times when we're doing work uh, on certain campaigns, you find a certain amount of populations kind of um, refusing to get the vaccines, right? I mean, for some so whatever reasons. And then I think we're just work, working with the teams at the local levels to find some local innovations and solutions to kind of make sure that the that the, that the, um, that the issue has been resolved is also a challenge. Uh, and, and, and there's been other challenges also I can remember. I think working at the national level and making sure, I think the IPV introduction with the polio endgame strategy plan um, uh, and, and Nepal was one of the first countries that introduced the IPV a lot, uh, in line uh, amongst the Gavi eligible countries, right? So I think 
we have to get all the evidence in place, but also make sure that the vaccines are kind of uh, rolled out properly. So I think putting all the evidence and um, getting all this uh, act in place, it, this is also this is also what been one of the uh, really challenging uh, take on uh, in, in my public health career. But lately, it's been the COVID nineteen vaccines and uh, the, the, the work on COVAX. And I think last year we we really, I mean, this was a unique opportunity and. Um, we had the chance to develop a strategic document for the COVID-19 vaccines deployment, uh, not knowing what the products are. And we're working with a different set of priority groups. So I think that was also a big, big challenge in terms of uh, really with all the vaccine agnostics to kind of get a strategic document for the country to kind of uh, plan in advance. So uh, thankfully on our side, we had a really good team and a good uh, collaboration with the partners to kind of uh, make this happen and um, it did go well. So these are the few challenges in my career so far. One of the things that you just touched on was that some groups were more resistant um, to like receiving vaccines. Um, so looking at the field from a global perspective, are there certain regions that tend to be more receptive to vaccines and immunizations or others that tend to be maybe a bit more resistant? Yeah, that's a good question. I think, um, and uh, in terms of geography, you mean the regions, like the WHO regions, right? So I think um, uh, each, uh, of these regions, they are really, really different, like in terms of how mature the immunization programs are, but it's not just the regions, right? Even within the regions, different countries are really different in terms of um, uh, how mature the immunization programs are, or in terms of uh, what's the milestones with the implement implementation of the strategies and the different set of challenges they approach. And, and this trickles down even from a, a country to a subnational level in a rural setting versus an urban setting. So I think um, at the global level, uh, the first point I'd like to say is that we really need to look from a holistic lens, but also make sure that it's really it can be tweaked and adapted to the regional and the country context. That's one thing I want to say. And the second thing I think this working with immunization and seeing this uh, really building block of this unique uh, collaborations and work team effort is really, really unique. And so the, the, this is, uh, and, and uh, there is really good uh, harmonization of work coming uh, from the region, from the countries to the regions and regions to the uh, headquarters. And at the headquarters level, we kind of uh, pretty much try to uh, be respectful to the regions and not work directly with the regions, but we try to work uh, with the regions at, uh, uh, if you if you want to support the country. So we don't try to work directly with the countries. And all of this kind of fits in into, uh, um, so in this way, this understanding of different strategies of where regions are and what are the challenges, it, 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 it does come along with the programs and, uh, and, and really the support that goes out to uh, different regions is really, really, it, it, it's different based on uh, the demands that's coming from the region, but it's also very challenge specific that's coming out of the regions, right? So I think um, it's really about having a good working relationship, I feel, with the regions is, uh, is important. And that really, and so far I've seen that the regions are very receptive to the specific humanization challenges. Uh, 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 that's coming uh, from the countries and they're really, in general, I feel they're very, very receptive and supportive and they really want, uh, will, will, would like to work towards the betterment of the EPI program, so yeah. When you've been working with those um, those regional offices or the regional governments, have there been any particular techniques or any tools that you found were particularly helpful um, that maybe other campaigns could use as well? Yes, uh, in terms of, um, yeah, I think I've, I've, I've been working a lot with uh, uh, the polio campaigns and with uh, measles campaigns. So I just, there is, uh, there is, I think the polio program is a very, very mature program and um, the, uh, even the strategies, the delivery strategies of house to house is very, very, I think it's very effective in reaching door to door to kind of, uh, get the coverage up, but that's in terms of strategy. But in terms of tools, I think uh, one of the things that uh, the campaigns has picked up is also about uh, the, the 
the the rapid convenient monitoring uh, system of kind of uh, doing this uh, survey immediately after the campaign to kind of uh, um, make sure that there is a corrective action taken immediately after after the campaign and that all of the mischildren are kind of vaccinated and a mop-up strategy which is to vaccinate all the mischildren is is an effective uh, tool to kind of get an understanding of about uh, getting your coverage high that's one thing which is the objective but also making sure that uh, that uh, the corrective action that taking place immediately after uh, after after the implementation of the campaigns yeah i feel this is a effective one right so let's talk a little bit about the role that the media plays. Um, we've seen the role of the media really expand in the last few years, and it can be kind of a double-edged sword. It's great for sharing information, but sometimes it can be used to spread misinformation. How has that affected your work, either hindering or helping? Yes, I do agree with that. And I think media is, is uh, with my experience, I've learned that if anything, it's important with the implementation. It's also having the uh, right balance uh, with the communication, with advocacy, with having the IC materials. And, uh, and, and, and media is an important aspect and so needs to be embedded right from the, right from the uh, inception phase of the planning, right? So I, I think uh, I do agree with that. And I, I initially, in the start of my career, I felt that uh, the community uh, we were not doing a good job on the communication and advocacy uh, to get the coverage uh, we wanted. But I, I have seen that that's the emphasis put more on the communication side over the years. So I feel it's I'm happy to see that. But I've had several experiences working with the media, um, and uh, I think it's been very like I said, it's, it needs to be embedded with the plan and in, uh, for having, uh, for running a good campaign or a SIA or even for new vaccines introductions. I think uh, you should really synchronize the work with the communications and media to get, uh, to get a good coverage. And one of the sensitive area in my, in my experience I've kind of uh, realized is, is um, uh, to kind of on, on the vaccine safety area, right? So that's more of an adverse effect following immunization. And one of the very experiences in, 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 the, in uh, while working with a few countries I've seen is that there was, there have been some unfortunate in, incidents with, with after administering a vaccine, right? And uh, uh, this really, it, it really had um, a very negative impact uh, on the immunization program immediately because uh, uh, because the media tends to kind of just publish it and not knowing the full picture and not understanding that a process of uh, there's a there's a process of a causal relationship to kind of needs to be determined for concluding at least if the adverse event is vaccine related or it's a coincidental or or or, or what the cause could be. In my experience with a certain incident, I felt uh, that, uh, that 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 didn't happen, and but eventually we were able to work with the Ministry of Health and with the media and uh, uh, just kind of uh, work it out and uh, establish a causal relationship and really determine that it was uh, it was not due to the vaccines. And also with the media, I feel that um, as as a very technical person. Um, there is a lot of science and evidence that we are gathering to kind of put the information out there, but it's also important that uh, we have one spokesperson from the Ministry of Health or from WHO to kind of give the consistency of me um, uh, messaging right throughout the event and uh, identify focal points in, in, uh, as a spokesperson. And, and I think it's very important to keep the media in loop uh, to get the right message out there. So, so that was one of my, one of my, uh, experiences uh, uh, working with the media. Let's start diving into COVID-19. So COVID has cast a global spotlight um, on vaccinations and their importance, but many countries have gaps in their readiness for deploying this vaccine, whether it's a lack of workers properly trained for vaccine distribution or improper vaccine safety systems or data gathering systems. What gaps have you dealt with in previous campaigns that you've worked on and how did you overcome those? So COVID-19, I absolutely agree, it's, it's taken a different turn. Uh, not just uh, not just to uh, the program, but also in, in, in various aspects of our life. But it's also really, I think, it's also a, 
the, as you said, if there, there is a spotlight on immunization and vaccines program, so it's really a good opportunity for us to kind of also really capitalize on this uh, uh, to kind of uh, uh, build up on the existing EPI program that we've been uh, working so hard over the years. So I think uh, just to give you a concrete, concrete example in terms of uh, uh, what we what happened there like uh, as i said that we'd work on a strategic document the national deployment vaccination plan and uh, we kind of really it was uh, it was really put together as a collaborative effort and it was really put fast in, and we were able to publish this document in november last year for countries to kind of really develop their strategies and the plans and uh, it was really really successful because more than 100 countries use this framework to kind of uh, uh, build up on this uh, on their plans, uh, but it, it did not stop there, right? So we did kind of, uh, once the plans were kind of put together by the countries, we did develop our, the team at WHO headquarters and partners, we kind of developed a process called the regional review process where a committee was set up in, in the regions and uh, they were validating the plans that was coming out of the country. So then, and so all of this was analyzed um, in, in, uh, at a certain point when all the, all the plans were put together. And, um, and just in the, uh, in the anal I'm, I'm just gonna share the reports from the analysis and uh, in, in, uh, uh, in terms of the plans that uh, the countries were developing that we saw that there was um, some of the issues around the gaps in costing and funding was one of the uh, major ones. But there was also some kind of uh, gaps identified in surveillance and in vaccine safety. These were some of the gaps that were identified over, over um, an analysis of all the NDDPs that the countries had kind of put together. And um, also um, there was um, a further analysis, more of a deep dive uh, done by the Gates team to kind of um, see uh, what, what came out of the plans out of the country. So, so there were that aspects, but uh, uh, moving forward, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of evolving moving pieces in terms of uh, trying to resolve all of those uh, gaps and those uh, situations that uh, countries have identified. And uh, there's a lot of resource materials that have been developed over time uh, after the NDVPs were published in November. So we have, uh, country specific guidance on cold chains or data and monitoring on surveillance and um, uh, on costings and the uh, certain tools to kind of help countries build their uh, built the uh, um, yeah, just to work on the gaps and also uh, we uh, this is an evolving uh, uh, evolving um, area of work so we are constantly working towards developing the strategic documents so that the regions and the countries they try to have, we try to give them a holistic picture of what are the updates that are happening on a regular basis with the COVAX and uh, that will eventually be helpful for the implementation of the COVID vaccines rollout. So, um, so yes, um, uh, there was the plan and then there is a review process and then there is also moving pieces towards uh, filling those gaps. Yeah. When we're talking about countries or regions preparing for one of these vaccine campaigns, what tends to be the biggest hurdle? Is it financing or vaccine hesitancy or maybe the workforce or something else? Yeah, I think uh, this is a good uh, question, but um, in terms of uh, really, I think uh, uh, some of the bigger hurdles, like you, you, you did mention, um, and I do agree that these are some of the hurdles, but I think the really the biggest hurdle, uh, while I have been working with different countries for setting up campaigns, is really having the uh, uh, having this sort of uh, high level political commitment, right, in, in the country. I mean, uh, just at the national level, this needs to be, this is an important part to get um, the high level political commitment. So I, I see that there is a lacking um, or an insufficiently high level political commitment. So that that that's that I could I feel is the big one. And uh, in terms of uh, other, it's more on the resources, and I will say it's mainly focused on the operational cost. Um, and 
I, 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 I certainly feel that even in the COVID vaccines, we've seen that uh, with the funding and the costing, it's all about um, uh, countries, uh, they are being supported with the COVID vaccines, but not so with the operational cost. And that's, that's, that's really a big challenge with, uh, with, uh, with uh, the implementation. And this is not a very different in a, in a campaign setting also. So I think I feel there is uh, really the lack in terms of operational resources and uh, at the national level and this and by the time even if there is um, uh, support going out to the countries by the time it trickles down to the local lower level it's really late you know so these are some of the uh, issues I feel is, is, is a big one but also there are other issues like uh, vaccines not being delivered in time so the, so that countries can have, um, you know, can deploy the vaccines to the primary healthcare center or even lower levels. So just um, the vaccination uh, um, deployment is untimely for, for the campaigns. And also um, in terms of all of this, it, it, it does sum up to that uh, there is also a late preparation of, um, of uh, activities like drawing a roadmap, drawing the right, micro plan. So, this is sometimes it, it, it really it, 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 it kind of creates a hollow in terms of uh, when you don't have a good micro plan you uh, you, uh, you don't have um, the clear job definitions for who supposed to be doing what so all of this is is is, 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 a, is a big one and, but lately i felt that we are really working towards integration of uh, we are really i mean uh, we've been doing the campaign tracking for um, disruptions uh, with the COVID-19 um, uh, with the COVID-19 pandemic, right? And we've seen there's a certain level of disruptions, and and with the, with the, and but we're also tracking the reinstating how the campaigns have been reinstated over time, and uh, we are finding that uh, there is a certain level of appetite for integration uh, of multi-antigen campaigns, and that's also actually happening, right? So with the work that we want to push forward with the integration there is really this uh, in the countries uh, also there's this really vertical disease approach and each uh, each focal point is really kind of moving uh, looking at uh, their specific antigen so I, I i feel that sometimes uh, when you want to really plan a good integrated campaign right at the start just the vertical disease approach is sometimes kind of uh, a hindrance and uh, so you might have to look at things from a horizontal approach so that's also one of the issues uh, we're facing uh, with kind of uh, getting uh, countries to uh, do more of this multi-antigen integrated approach of, of the campaigns. This is interesting so do you think that um, in a way COVID has helped accelerate the trend towards campaign integration, or was this already a trend that you had seen before COVID hit? So um, integration is not a very new topic uh, in, 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 in the immunization uh, field, right? So I, uh, it's, it's definitely, I mean, uh, it's, it's just that we happen to be tracking the disruptions over time with, uh, with the COVID pandemic. And uh, uh, We've also kind of uh, we've also kind of seen that uh, a multi antigen integrated approach is really happening now. Uh, looking back and just talking with the countries, they feel that uh, with so much of delays, it's better to kind of integrate programs, and it's uh, and um, and there is. Uh, more done with with the, with uh, with a similar effort. That sort of a, that sort of a thing is also coming out. But uh, but uh, like I said, otherwise um, they already have an integrated uh, plan uh, uh, prior to the COVID. So that's what they're implementing. We're seeing that level also. But at the global level, we are also uh, uh, with this tracker that we're developing. We are also kind of mapping uh, different antigens, right? In terms of uh, what is a potential match in the coming days for a certain antigen to match with a, uh, a different antigen or with a health intervention. So we're doing that mapping exercise at a global level. And, and if we see a potential map, we are definitely talking it out with um, different disease focal points and uh, trickling this down to the regional office and uh, and uh, and to the country office to make sure if they're uh, just to kind of see if there's any space for uh, operationalization of this integration. So there is uh, there there is this work with the cap and tracker that we are tracking, but we are also working towards uh, pushing the agenda for operationalization of this integration. 